So uh, how, do, how do you make an independent film for family, for a family, you know, one that's family friendly? Can you do that? <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore, and I am pleased to introduce to our podcast today and bring on the podcast Sean Olson, the director of Max Winslow and the House of Secrets. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. It's you know I, I see a lot of independent films, and a lot of them they kind of fall into tropes. There's sort of exploitation and horror. There's sort of the finding yourself type of film. There's a road movies. Road movies are big in movies. In independent films, a lot of people go on the road to have a, a journey of discovery. Uh, but Max, Max Winslow in the House of Secrets is is really truly fits into a family film category. I mean, not that like it doesn't also have an appeal to adults. I enjoyed it. I I, I I love the sources of inspiration. We'll get into that. But it's not often that you see a, a making of an independent film in the in the family genre. So I really want to want to talk about. Uh, uh, what made you what made you want to do that? Well, it's actually uh, it's the second film I've done in this specific genre. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a movie called Freddy, which is on Netflix now. And it uh, it was done with the idea that um, both adults and kids could watch something together and enjoy it. And I have two boys. So I've seen a lot of like home entertainment over and over and over again. Um, things that they've been watching. And so I was inspired by, you know, movies from the eighties, which I grew up like Amblin films and, you know, things like that. So we did, we had such a success with Freddie that we decided we wanted to do something, you know, in that realm, but maybe a little bit more edgy, a little, uh, give it a little bit of scare, um, but not too scary. You know, we really have kind of striven to, you know, not put, you know, a lot of violence in this in these types of films. There's no cussing and nudity and that. So we just really wanted something that the entire family could get together and enjoy. Well, it's um, I, I'm sure I'm sure you know uh, I'm not the first person to point this out, but it is very much inspired by Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> yes, yeah, which uh, which I yeah. love that film. You know, yeah. you know if you're gonna get some inspiration, get it from somewhere. You know, something that's successful. Yeah. Um, but I, I disagree with. I think that like if I was a kid and saw this, there are parts of this that are really scary. And what I do like about it is, um, in the same way that Willy Wonka has each of these kids kind of they each have these personalities and kind of have to confront something about themselves. This movie is different because it's transformative, right? It's yeah. in the sense that each of the characters is confronting something about their own personality or some some trauma that they've had from early in their life that they now have to confront and transcend. There, one of the characters in particular, the the guy, I guess he's the bully, right? Um, has to deal with an aspect of his life. Uh, and normally in a film like this, it'd be like, ah, that's the, it's just going to come down to the, you know, the protagonist. But in this, I thought it was really interesting the way you dealt with each of the kids. And these are teenagers in, in high school that are, we should get into a little bit of the story, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let, let, so let's talk about the story first. Then I want to shift to the characters and then what, what may, made you want to uh, structure it that way. Okay. Uh, the story is pretty much about uh, five teenagers who are invited by this eccentric billionaire um, played by Chad Michael Murray. His name's Atticus Virtue. And um, he is a very Elon Musk type where you know he launches rockets into space and has a bullet train across the country and all sorts of things. But he's also very much like Willy Wonka in a way where we don't know that much about his private life. He's kind of disappeared. And so he hijacks the, uh, the school's, uh, you know, inside camera system, um, the, the closed circuit TV system. And he invites um, five kids to stay overnight at his house. And then the winner of a, he has a contest and the winner of that contest gets to keep the keys of the mansion. And so you see kind of like the golden ticket where, you know, you see all these different characters, they, at a certain time, their phones will ding and then they get the, the message and you see all these different archetype characters, you know, get the message and get invited to stay overnight. And what happens is when they get to the mansion, it's not all, all that they expected. There's a little bit more happening than just the contest. 
Um, each of these characters go through some sort of a change. Um, they all fundamentally have flaws, like you had mentioned. And um, for us, that was like the biggest thing to kind of crack was um, making each kid's journey different, but, you know, giving them a journey. Well, it's, it's, I got to say, it's interesting because uh, in a way, I mean, the, the easy comparison, yes, is Willy Wonka. Um, I like that you uh, compared virtue to um, Elon Musk. I thought I saw that. that uh, but it's interesting because you really modernized it. I mean, they get their in information by cell phones and the characters are dealing with a lot of different issues. One, you know, bullying and another one just um, sort of our selfie obsessed culture and Instagram yeah. and social media currency uh, that I thought was really amazing. So in a way you're touching on all the things that teenagers and as a parent, I'm a parent myself. And, uh -huh. and so I really feel like the film deals with all of the things that teenagers are having to grapple with today that, you know, Willy Wonka may actually seem kind of dated. I mean, I, I think I read, Willy Wonka at the Chocolate Factory in like third grade, but this, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, Mike TV, right? But you've got like that Instagram, you know, you've got the girl who is obsessed with, um, you know, social media currency. You've also got a kid that's obsessed with video games, mm -hmm. right? And then you have Max Winslow, which I love that Max Winslow, my assumption, right? Max Winslow, a guy, it's actually a young girl, yeah. and she's dealing with the uh, she, she's dealing with the family issue. I don't want to ruin too much of it. Um, you can see the trailer on YouTube, um, and you can check it out. Wait, it's it's out now. Am I right? Back it's out in theaters now. It's a limited release. So as like theaters are opening up because of you know COVID nineteen and everything, um, it's playing in a in a couple right now in Iowa, Kentucky. Uh, I just found out we'll be playing in a couple theaters in Florida, Texas, and Arizona. So it's been kind of a slow rollout. We were originally supposed to release April 24th. And as that day got closer and closer and closer, I was like, there's no way this is going to happen. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of, you know, just kind of going with it for right now. Yeah. Well, uh, drive-ins are an option. You know, there's the, yeah. um, the Mission Tiki drive-in, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, it's uh, more east side. Um, or more south of Southern California, I guess. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's that theater has been playing new independent films. I think they had like a couple of films from IFC. It's uh -huh. it's pretty awesome. So dr drive-ins are going to make a comeback because of all this, because it's the ultimate way to social distance and see a movie. I really want movie theaters to come back. I will be first in line when movie theaters open. Yeah. I don't care if I have to wear a mask during the whole film. I don't care. I'm going to the movies. You just so want I really to tenant, right? Oh, I'm going to, I'll be there. I'll be there day one. I will be there day one. I am. Nothing is going to keep me from theaters or my favorite local bars, which I can't yeah. wait for those to open. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but so, so it's opening in theaters. It'll be on VOD or coming out on VOD. Yeah, that's the plan. It's probably in August. Um, it'll be on VOD and, um, you know, we're still kind of searching for that, that full on streaming deal, but we, you know, we have plans for, you know, you'd be able to purchase it on Amazon and then we have a deal that's uh, with Walmart that you can get DVDs and Blu-rays of the movie. So, well, let's talk uh, about what it's like to, because I, I think that there's um, I, just because, you know, we don't cover a lot of family films on mm -hmm. film threat. I mean, we do when like Disney puts out a film or Pixar or whatnot, but yeah. indie an indie family film is not one that we usually come across. So can you talk to me about what are some of the particular challenges in trying to market and distribute a film at that level? I mean, I got to think, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what your budget was, but it looks like, it looks like a big budget. A, I, that opening sequence from the opening sequence to a couple of the, um, I, I want I don't want to spoil anything, but there are a couple of action sequences that are, I mean, this looks like a big movie. So when, I, when this is over, I can tell you what the real budget is because you'll, you'll be shocked. But uh, we uh, originally, so our opening sequence kind of is like almost like a newsreel of like who Chad Michael Murray's character is. And um, originally in the script, it was just this mysterious guy walks through the mansion and it's intercut with titles, and and that's all it was. Is it was just this mysterious guy. We never really knew who he was until he kind of takes control of like the TV station, and uh, or the the school's close close circuit television. 
And after testing it, uh, showing it to a friend of mine and a couple of other friends, um, we decided, you know what, we really kind of need to know who Elon Musk is or Atticus Virtue is. And um, one, of the, one of the guys who did the newsreel at the beginning, he's a friend of mine, Jerry Penicoli. Um, he, he worked at Extra for a number of years. He lives in uh, um, Florida now. And I said, hey, wouldn't, would it be cool if you just like went around in a couple of spots and shot some stand-ups and then we'll put some CGI in the background. So, you know, so that whole section kind of evolved. And we, I actually had a bunch of other news people. Um, Pat LaLama is the first voice you hear. And she was on um, Celebrity Justice and she's been on Nancy Grace. So I think that that um, putting real news people in the opening really, um, really, you know, gives it a bigger scale and, and that. But there's a lot of visual effects in the movie. There's like almost 500, but they were all done by one person, Dorian Clevenger. And uh, okay, 500 digital effect shots. I remember like when the, when the Star Wars movies would come out, they'd say there are 300 yeah. digital effect, shot, di effect shots yeah. in Return yeah. of the Jedi. Anyways, but like, so, so yeah. how that one person did it, is it just because the off the shelf software is just more readily available and easier to use? Yeah, he's, he's one of those guys who's gotten better and better at it. So um, he actually did a lot of the, the visual effects for Freddy. And um, so um, Dorian's one of those guys that, you know, you, you ask him like, Hey, can you do, let's do this shot and this shot and this shot. And then he'll like send a sequence back. He'll download a copy of the movie and then he'll send a sequence back and say, Hey, what do you think about this, 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 and this? So like, there's a scene in the movie and it's really subtle. You probably, you may have noticed it may have not, uh, where it's snowing backwards. So the snow is going up as opposed to down. And that sequence wasn't even meant to be, you know, it wasn't scripted as playing in the snow. It kind of, you know, it was one of those lucky things where um, it was the first time snowing in Arkansas in the area of Arkansas that we shot in like four years. And um, so we had snow that day. It, I think it really helps with that bully character, the Aiden character that you're talking about. Um, and, and then he just said, Hey, what if we make it snow the other way? And I said, well, why don't we take a look at it? So, you know, it was, it's little things like that. There's other things that you wouldn't even notice. Like there's a hallway where there were switch plate covers and it didn't really look great with the bricks. So he kind of just cloned it. And so, yeah, he's been, he's been utilizing after effects and, and those types of things. And he's been kind of building up on it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question about a family film, um, I'm, I'm really big into family films, you know, like ET and the Goonies and those types of things. And I think that's kind of where we were going with it, but there is a challenge because you know, there's so many Disney films and Pixar films and, and those things. And, you know, a movie like Max Winslow is not going to compete with any of those types of movies. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people at home um, that, you know, kids watch and consume things over and over and over again. And it kind of helped. We kind of, you know, the idea was that it would kind of fill a gap. And uh, with Freddie, it's done, you know, it's done remarkably well. And so we just kind of wanted to, you know, do that with this as well. Yeah. It's, um, I, I would actually think that because you're kind of competing in a category where, I mean, you're competing against a lot of these big family films, right. Yeah. But, but I feel like that this thing stands toe and toe with them in yeah. terms of just the, the ideas behind it. Um, I just, just having, you know, raised kids myself, like you see, like, these are the challenges they're dealing with. It's very, it's very contemporary. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure it's been described uh, maybe in its review on filmthreat.com uh, <laughs> as like a, a contemporary Willy Wonka, right? Cause it's yeah. Willy Wonka is dealing with sort of types of kids and they're, they're all sort of the same. They're all brats, right? Mm -hmm. All these kids are brats. The difference with your film is they all have uh, issues that they need to confront yeah. um, an issue that's about themselves and they need to find a way to transcend it to actually at least have a chance to win. And I think that that's what makes it very special. It's, it's different from Willy Wonka in that sense. It's, mm -hmm. it's what, what your film does, which I really, really love is that these characters uh, are seeking redemption. There's redemption as a part of it, right? Like, for yeah, each yeah. Of those yeah, I think that that just makes it better rather than just saying, well, Mike TV is a dick, you know, like, <laughs> Which like he is, you know? just eating or yeah, or 
Veruca Salt or yeah. Yeah. yeah like, uh, yeah. So it's just like, they're horrible kids. Well, it's just like, well, yeah, but then you see, especially with the bully, like the way he um, deals with his issue is so well done and unexpected. Like mm -hmm. I just, I, so I'm just curious what the reaction has been from kids not that a uh, lot that you know when you say family film it's just like to me the best ones are the ones that you can enjoy as an adult as well right yeah, yeah. but i really am curious what did kids how did kids respond to the film so far the kids have been um they've really liked the movie like it's one of those things where like i've uh, the thing about the movie is there's so many different elements to it too it's like you have the video game element so if like you're a kid who likes vr and, and those types of things you know they're really drawn to that um, I mean, there are a couple of frightening scenes and, and one of the, I remember, um, with the Sophia scene, there's a whole face off between two versions of herself and that's in the trailer. So, um, and I think that has terrified, um, some kids, but my kids have come in while I've been cutting it, like I'll cut a scene and I'll play it for them. And it's, that's like the scene that they love and there's seven and nine. Um, but they're usually a little bit more on the edgier material, like um, I, they've seen all the Jaws movies already. And, you know, um, but one thing I was going to say too is um, you had mentioned Max and when you'd heard the name Max, you thought, well, it, it would be a guy. And originally um, when our writer, Jeff Wilde wrote the script, it was a male character. And our producer, Johnny Remo of Skipstone Pictures, he, uh, he and I worked on Freddy together. He said, he suggested, he's like, hey, why don't we make her, you know, make, max female and it was one of those things that kind of just was so obvious to us it kind of opened everything up um and our, and the actress who played max sydney mckell like she was our first choice from the first audition that we saw her in um she really embodied that character but yeah i mean a lot of the kids that have seen it we've had big you know we've had screenings in arkansas we've had screenings in california they've really really enjoyed the movie like i know one person their kid wanted to see it again right afterwards, which I think is probably the best compliment you can get from it. From well, the I, I just think it's so modern, you know, it's so like it basically deals with every aspect of things that kids are dealing with today, whether it's um, social media, you know, obsession with social media and looking for social media currency, whether it's bullying, whether it's video game obsession, you kind of hit all these points that, teenagers are having you know the challenges that they're having to deal with yeah so and and just sort of reconciling aspects of your relationship with your parents i mm -hmm. think that was just so well done i'm saying this because i want people watching or listening to to uh to notice that um and you mentioned jaws yeah I, there's jaws I, just just to point out the background you've got jaws <laughs> back there you got um your poster for your movie and somebody left an emmy Somebody oh, left yeah, an right. Emmy up there. Hey, look at this though. So this, um, my buddy uh, know, knows Joe Alves. And so this is one of the barrels and Joe signed it. And I had that done at- Oh my God. Dark Delicacies. It's so cool. Oh, Dark Delicacies. Yeah. Man, I'm really looking forward to that. I don't know if they're open yet. Dark Delicacies a bookstore, yeah. like Burbank area that- yeah has collectibles and hard to find books and sort of it's it's basically halloween year round at dark delicacies yeah. and they they champion all all your favorite nerd films well, but I, book, have you seen his book no well, i have not oh my gosh he has a he has a book um and it has storyboards the original storyboards he used to pitch to spielberg to do the movie oh my god it's really cool wow yeah it's wow really cool. Jaws is one of those movies that like, you know, like after it came out, I think the only thing that even existed was a Jaws board game. But in recent years, there has actually been merchandising related to Jaws. Yeah. I, I have a Jaws uh, plug for your sink where you put it in the plug <laughs> in your sink and it's just the Jaws like that, like coming out of your sink. It's kind of yeah. cool. I, cool. Well, I've got me uh, some towels. So I have a beach clothes towel and I have a Amity Islands, you know, the, the painted mural. Have, right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's but, but you can tell actually, you know, seeing you, all the stuff that you have in your background makes a lot of sense now watching the movie because it is kind of feel, uh, filled with all those influences, those sort of yeah. nerd movie influences. I say it's a good thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like I, I did, um, 
about 12 years ago, I did a, uh, we, you know, like the 48 hour film project that everybody Oh yeah. Did. Yeah. Yeah. So originally I was going to do the 48 hour film project and I worked with a buddy of mine on it and he did a 24 parody called seven, which was great. And then the following weekend we got together and we did a live action GI Joe short. And, uh -huh. um, with the GI Joe short, um, we were able to, um, shout factory reached out to us. They saw the short, everything in there was original, like the score and everything mm -hmm. other than the name GI Joe. And they put it in the box set, which was super cool. Oh my God. Wow. So, they really, um, they do a great job with those box sets. shout factory. Yeah. We they could, um, some of our release. I'm not sure the specifics of, of what, but we are working with them on some of the, the maximums that are released. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, Sean Olson, um, thank you so much for talking to us uh, on the Film Threat podcast today. Where can people find out more about the film on social, your website? Yeah. Um, give so, us all that. So our website is uh, maxwinslowmovie.com. And then um, we're on Instagram and Facebook at, at maxwinslowmovie. So you can check it out there. Great. Great. Um, thank you again. And congratulations on the theatrical release. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that puts you in running for an Oscar. <laughs> uh, it does technically speaking yeah. it does put you in the running for an oscar which is awesome but um thank you so much for uh talking to us on the film threat podcast uh it's been great we got to have you back to talk nerd stuff too all right thank you so much and i, I just wanted to say one thing uh jeff wild uh the writer and jason brandt the composer like are freaking amazing to work with and um actually you know what i also started a company called trash panda entertainment uh -huh. I, know, I know we're kind of at the end, but I want to talk to you about that because my business partner, Christian Beckman of Quantum Creation, uh -huh. he designed stuff for, he actually did dinosaurs for the Jurassic Park World um, Tour. Like Whoa. stand up, yeah. Oh, so, wait, is that the, okay, first of all, I think I met, I met, I met those guys. This is like a live action show, right? It's a live action it's show. Live action he show. Created, he created Blue. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. I went to the Batman one. They had a Batman one, and they had yeah. Marvel. These are live the shows. He did work on the Marvel one. Okay, cool. So I've been to both of those shows. Okay. I haven't. Obviously, the Jurassic World one is it's delayed as you know everything yeah. this year. Twenty twenty is going to be a year we're just going to like we're just going to delete. Uh, right. <laughs> yes. Go yeah. away. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll end strong with it with a good year. Uh, for 2020, but um, that's awesome. Yeah, those those live shows. Um, I've been to the Batman one and the Marvel one, and they're just they're kind of cheesy, but it's like then the acting is overdone. But you're seeing like live effects and like there's cars and explosions, and it's like there's an intermission and there's all the people are dressed up and it's it's dramatic music. It's it's um you know it's it's like going to Broadway, but for like an action movie. Well, you so, should see this Triceratops. It's like it's huge. And wow, I can't wait for that. Raptors are one person in a suit. And so the biggest challenge for them was to get something that didn't weigh them down too much. So, wow. well, um, I'm going to have to check that out. Uh, Sean Olson, thank, thank you for you. talking to us. Uh, and, and, and check, check out the film, Max Winslow and the house of secrets. It is, uh, find a way to see it. However, however you see it. And thank you very much. Thanks again for talking to us. All right.